Federal Housing Administration set up also loans. And again, uh, the idea there was to insure mortgages up to 80%, but at the same time, they favored new housing. And uh, part of the act itself said older properties have a tendency to deteriorate, uh, I'm sorry, to accelerate the rate of transition to low class occupancy. I recommended to you at that time the book called Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. <clears throat> he really goes into great detail and, and helps to make that understandable. This is a map of St. Louis according to the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And so depending upon the color area is whether or not you could get a loan. And the, uh, the red areas tend to correspond with African American communities and they could not get loans. We said last time around, part of the reason for this was in order to pass this legislation, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to have the Southern Democrats voting with him. And the Southern Democrats obviously are, are prejudiced against African Americans, and so that legislation, that, that prejudice is baked into all the New Deal legislation. We saw that uh, also that um, <clears throat> the man on the right, Charles Vatterot, tried mightily in order to break this system. Um, and, and what he introduced then was the Morton de Porres community in Breckenridge Heights. This was a community specifically, lower income houses, uh, think of St. Anne's, think of Overland. These are similar kind of houses that were specifically set up for uh, black families. But what he found out was that they could not get loans, neither uh, through the uh, FHA or the VA. <coughs> and in the end, they had to rent. And, that, and this is an extremely important point because this denied these families to begin building equity in home ownership. That's a real way of making uh, in income and advancement in America is home ownership. And there's a whole class of people that were denied that possibility. We looked at the three highway systems that were set in. And uh, if you remember that uh, uh, Clarence Law, uh, uh, Lang, who was also the books mentioned in there, uh, said that it's called urban renewal, but in fact that what it was was Negro removal. And so you had Highway 40, 64, that cut right through the Mill Creek area displacing 1,700 families without anything, for, any place for them to go. You also had Highway 70 that uh, went north, 5570, that went through old North St. Louis and the Hyde Park neighborhood. White families then moved out to North County or Northwest County, and the end result is that black families moved into those dilapidated houses. No, okay. no, it does. No. And Interstate Highway 55 cut south of the Soulard area, doing the same thing. We looked at uh, Sarah Siegel, Siegel and her study, and how that was. Um, do I need to move? No, we're going to move that. We're going to try. Okay. We saw that uh, what happened with Soldan High School, that it was a, a, an all-white high school at one point, Jewish and Catholic, <coughs> mostly Jewish and that they voluntarily desegregated in 1955 and with that some 375 black students enrolled coming from Sumner High School and Vashon High School but within three and a half years the school itself was 99 percent black and so the question there was what happened to all the white kids that had been going to that school and we found that basically they uh, ended up going to um, County, um, county public schools. We'll see a little bit later on that they did not have the option of going to Catholic high schools. We'll, we'll see, see that a little bit later. <coughs> okay. 
We talked a little bit also about, um, does that help? He shouldn't have turned it Well, I'll just continue talking. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, so we also saw that when it was, it became possible legally then for uh, blacks to move into the county, uh, that uh, that what happened was you had these uh, blockbuster realtor realtor groups that used various tactics, and uh, they used them here in University City also as well as other areas. Basically, they would target a neighborhood, and then they would hire black women to walk. Uh, babies through the uh, perambulators uh, through the neighborhoods. They also uh, hired black teens to drive convertibles through the neighborhoods, blaring loud music. And then also they had black men that would be hired to go up to doors and ask whether a house was for sale. The whole idea was to panic the whites who were living in the neighborhood and, uh, and convince them that they had to leave. So they would panic, they would sell their houses to the realtors cheap, and then they would move out to a, what they would consider to be a safe neighborhood. And, um, and then uh, the houses then would be sold to black families, but at an inflated cost. And so the realtors themselves are the ones who are actually making money off of this. And of course, the redlining is, is involved in all of this too. As a result of that, you ended up with <coughs> A, a shift in the county of various county uh, neighborhoods, uh, the, uh, the racial shift. Mentioned also that this frustration is eventually going to lead to action. The three things that you hear over and over again in all the literature is that African Americans wanted three things. They wanted jobs, they wanted education, they wanted housing. Up until the 1932 election, African American St. Louisans were solidly Republican. It's a long, long history there. But for years, they had been asking for one simple thing, and that was a hospital. Now, African Americans were served by two hospitals in St. Louis. One of those was St. Mary's, and the other one was City Hospital Number Two. And St. Mary's Hospital. Besides having the sisters there, including there were a few African American sisters, Franciscan sisters, but also they had a school there for uh, nurses. So blacks were able to study nursing uh, at, at St. Mary's Hospital and, and get their, um, uh, their certificates that way. They also had black doctors at, uh, at both City Hospital Number no. Two and St. Mary's. But the one difference was that the administration was in both of those cases was white. In the one case of St. Mary's, it was a nun, and in the case of, of, uh, of uh, City Hospital, it was, um, uh, it was a, a, a white administrator. And for years, the Republican Party here in St. Louis had been promising blacks that they would get their own hospital, and it never came about. And finally, in 1932, um, one of the leaders uh, an organizer of, of black votes, a man by the name of, of uh, Jordan Pop Chambers, who was actually a mortician, rallied people together. They went to the Democratic candidate, Bernard Dickman, and he promised them a hospital, and he delivered on it. And this is Homer G. Phillips Hospital. And if this was a hospital for African Americans, it was staffed by African Americans, and the administrator was Virgil McKnight, uh, who was African American also. He was a member of uh, Blessed Sacrament Parish. And, uh, and besides that, a number of other patronage shops came then to, to blacks. And after that, blacks in St. Louis, and throughout the United States, but especially in St. Louis, shifted their vote and voted solidly for Democrats ever since. But there's this, a, a side to this, and that is it's going to be a black hospital serving African Americans, run by African Americans, but it was built by whites. There were no uh, uh, black contractors in building the uh, uh, Homer G. Phillips. It was a WPA project from the New Deal, 
but no blacks were, were hired. And this began setting up a, a sense of frustration. So again, this is uh, Clarence Lang. Uh, he writes a book called uh, Grassroots at the Gateway, a Class Politics and Black Freedom Struggle in St. Louis, 1936-1970. And he said this, as I mentioned last time, or well, we read this last time around, that there was a, a, a self-conscious movement that got underway uh, within the black community itself. And it was multifaceted, but there was a real sense that something had to be done. And so some of the actions that happened here at St. Louis <clears throat> mentioned the double victory rallies by um, uh, A. Philip Randolph. Uh, the double victory being that if you're going to have people go off and fight fa fascism and racism in Europe and militarism and, fa and, and racism in, in uh, Asia and in the Pacific, then we need to be able to also fight racism here in the United States. And we're gonna see here at Washington University in particular, how that notion of double victory becomes really important. Uh, you also had uh, action, like for instance, in Southwestern Bell had refused to hire more African Americans. And the end result was that in September of 1943, uh, everyone got together and they paid their, their phone bill by, by pennies. That got the attention of um, Southwestern Bell and they ended up hiring more uh, people then. Uh, we had the, the riot that took place in, uh, in Fairgrounds Park, uh, and then the campaign of don't shop where you can't work, and that got underway too. Uh, other actions included St. Louis University integrating its graduate school in 1944, mainly through the efforts of Father Claude Heidhaus, and Washington University also integrates. The reason for that was that the GI Bill had given these, uh, these uh, veterans an opportunity to go to college. Washington U had a lot of students, that, uh, uh, veterans, and these veterans were very upset that they looked down the street and they saw St. Louis University integrating. Washington U did not. And so these veterans, all white, went and boycotted against her. They, they, they acted against uh, Washington University under the guise, again, of the double victory and with that, Washington U caved and then began admitting black students. Over at Webster College, the sisters over there didn't know what to do, and so they put, a, put it to a vote to the uh, student body, and the student body overwhelmingly voted in favor of it. You also had a number of, uh, of political actions taking place. First of all, uh, Reverend John Hicks is elected to the school board, the public school board, uh, Theodore McNeil, is the first African-American uh, Missouri senator, and he beats Hogan and his, uh, his machine to do that. William Clay, at that same election, wins his automatic post, and voter registration went from 56,000 to 100,000. It's gonna make a big difference. And then, uh, one of the key moments in the civil rights struggle in St. Louis came with the sit-in on August 31st of 1963, um, with the, uh, uh, the protest that closed down Jefferson Bank until they hired more um, African-American tellers. And I just found out last week one of our number was there. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. More action takes place. Uh, March of 1965, while there was uh, marching down in Selma, Alabama, <clears throat> uh, Ivory Perry um, uh, rented a truck and he drove onto the uh, exit, the King's Highway exit on Highway 64, and he parked the truck right there, and he went in and took out the, uh, the distributor cap, and nobody could get around him. And he basically shut down that part of the highway. Uh, the police came, and he negotiated with them long enough until a news uh, uh, outlets arrived, and at that point, he said he did this in order to draw attention to the Negro cause in Selma, Alabama. 1969, there was a renter strike against low-income housing in St. Louis. This was supported by the Archdiocese of St. Louis, but it was only supported uh, verbally. Uh, it, 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 there was no other uh, action done. That same year, also a group known as Action, or the Action Committee to Improve Opportunities for Negroes, uh, they tar targeted services during the uh, church, church services, 
and demanded money. And ultimately what happened was they were heavily criticized by black clergy here in St. Louis, as well as the local chapter of the NAACP, and eventually stopped. <clears throat> there were no rice, uh, race riots in, in St. Louis in the 1960s. In fact, if you look at St. Louis, not until Ferguson do we actually have riots that are taking place. And Clarence Lang says he believes that this is due to a long biracial civility, liberal integrationist negotiations, and electoral um, patternism. So a little bit about the Archdiocese of St. Louis. And, and, and the reality is that we have a checkered history. It's a, it's a good history and it's a bad history at the same time. And we need to be honest about it. First of all, slavery existed here in St. Louis very early on. St. Louis was not built by slaves. It was built by Creoles <clears throat> uh, for the most part, people coming up from, from um, New Orleans and from uh, Canada. But very early on, African Americans were brought in as slaves to be used in, in mines, especially uh, the lead mines and salt mines in um, south of St. Louis. Others came into St. Louis mainly uh, for domestic purposes. We have evidence, and this is, uh, we're working on this my, myself, and we have a committee in the archdiocese that's trying to find out more information about this in the archives. Uh, we have evidence that Bishop Duborg and Bishop Rosati bought, held, and sold black slaves. It's a, it, it came as a shock. It, it really came as a shock. But we've got the, we've got the physical evidence, the, the bill of sales, and letters that went back and forth in which uh, uh, slaves were, were uh, transferred from one place to another. We know that uh, other religious orders had slaves. The, the Jesuits have gone out of their way, and, and they're, they're really the, um, the, the most forward-thinking. Um, they're, they're using their archives in order to identify the slaves that they had, especially at St. Stanislaus Seminary, and identify those slaves, and then do the genealogy and try to contact the descendants of those slaves. And it's their intention to give the children of the descendants education, free education, at their institutions. It's a beautiful uh, way to do that. I, would, I don't know where we are at this point, but then. We know also that Peter Richard Kenrick, Archbishop of St. Louis, owned at least one slave. His name was Thomas Franklin, and he was freed and then hired by the Archbishop as a butler. Um, he stayed with Archbishop uh, Kenrick throughout his entire life. He was very loyal to him, and, uh, and, and the very last person Henry saw before he closed his eyes and died was Thomas Franklin. He was there, right there in his, in his death. They had no priest, no Monsignor, no other bishop, but, uh, but uh, Mr. Franklin. Um, Kenrick also established St. Elizabeth Parish for African Americans. Uh, that's a checkered thing in and of itself because he, he made necessary that all blacks had to go to that one parish, and no whites were allowed to go to that parish, even if they lived in the neighborhood or within the territory. The reason he did that, as best I could tell, and I've done a lot of reading, I've been trying to get into that man's mind, and, and the best I could tell is that he looked upon African Americans as an ethnic group. And he had parishes for the Irish, like St. Bridget's, he had the Germans go to Holy Trinity, the Poles went to St. Stanislaus, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, St. Elizabeth's was the black parish in St. Louis. Uh, it's also Peter Richard Kenrick who funded St. Francis Home for Black Girls. And eventually uh, that moved out to, to Normandy and continued serving until, I don't know when it, it stopped, but continued serving for quite a while. Other St. Louisans who held slaves, I think it's important for us to know this also. Uh, William Greenleaf Elliott, the founder of Washington University, uh, he's an abolitionist, and yet at the same time, he also owned, and I put that in, in quotation marks, he owned uh, Archer Alexander until March 30th of 1863, three months after the Emancipation Proclamation, when he finally freed Archer um, Alexander. 
The reason I put that in quotations is that Archer Alexander had, was a fugitive slave. Uh, he had been sent out to central Missouri. He escaped and made his way back to St. Louis. And he was downtown looking for work when Mrs. Elliott came along and hired him. And so he came out to the Elliott's house and they began working there. And it became very obvious to William uh, Elliott that he was a, uh, a runaway slave and he didn't do anything about it until after the Emancipation Proclamation. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, another thing too that's important is that, you know, there's a big move in Washington, D.C. right now to take down this statue, which is Abraham Lincoln, and there's an African-American who's uh, kneeling there. His chains have been broken, and, um, and he's rising up. And uh, the interesting thing about this is the model for that statue was Archer Alexander, right here from St. Louis. Uh, and, and the statue itself was paid for, $5 a piece, was paid for by ex-slaves who donated to, uh, to make this, uh, this monument. There was a committee that determined how the monument would look, and Frederick Douglass was one of the members of that committee. It's an all-black committee. And they, they designed this specifically in order to show the Emancipation Proclamation. And if you know, notice also that Archer Alexander is not looking up at Lincoln, but he's looking forward to the future. A lot of people don't know that about, um, uh, about that statue, and they want to tear it down without knowing anything about it. Uh, another individual who owned slaves was uh, Arnold uh, Krekel. Uh, he was a German immigrant. He was a surveyor for St. Charles County, and he had a newspaper in St. Charles County. And he was an abolitionist, but he owned a slave. And the, uh, if, if any of you had seen that uh, the uh, play that, uh, that Cecilia Nadal put on a year or two ago, uh, Krekel was, was in, involved in that play. Um, he owned a slave. He did that because he helped to, to run his farm. Uh, Krekel had his wife and a daughter, and that, that was all, so they couldn't run the farm, and he couldn't continue running the uh, other businesses that he had, and so rather than hire him, he had a slave. I, you know, it's, it's kind of strange for abolitionists to do that, but they did. Another two I'd like to mention, one of those is uh, Frederick Dent. He's the father-in-law of Ulysses S. Grant, and uh, he had 30 slaves. <clears throat> where Grant's farm is now, that was a plantation. And he had 30 slaves, the Dent family. Um, Grant fell in love with Julia Dent. They married. Uh, Grant himself was against slavery. Uh, he and his, his in-laws constantly fought over it. And at one point, um, uh, Frederick Dent went ahead and uh, I guess he wanted to impress Grant with the beauties of slavery, and he gave one of his slaves to uh, Grant. Uh, this was William Jones, and immediately upon receiving the papers, they went downtown and did the manumission papers to free him, and this was in 1859. So if you remember out in California, or yeah, out in California a couple weeks ago, the Grant statue was torn down, and the reason for that was the people said, well, he was a slave owner. Yeah, for about 12 hours, you know, but take that as well. Uh, another one who also owned uh, slaves was John Sappington. We have a road named after him, and uh, he had slaves on his plantation. He's most well known for uh, um, concocting an anti-malarial drug, uh, which he made a lot of money off of. But uh, there's another story about him that, that I'll just share with you. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's a good story. <coughs> Um, he had three daughters, and the oldest daughter uh, fell in love with a man by the name of, um, of um, Jackson. Um, he later on became the governor of Missouri. Um, William, uh, uh, it's Fox, Fox Jackson, I forget his first name now. But uh, anyway, he, he tried to take Missouri out of the Union. Uh, anyway, um, he, he married, he's, he's going to get married to the oldest Sappington daughter. They're engaged, and the daughter died before the wedding. And so rather than give up, 
he then he proposed to the second daughter. And uh, the second daughter accepted. And uh, before the wedding, she died. <laughs> so he turned to the youngest daughter, and she agreed to marry him. Mm -hmm. And when he went to uh, Dr. Sappington to ask for her hand, uh, Sappington's response was, you can take her, but if she dies, don't come back for the old lady. <laughs> This is probably the hardest slide of all. <clears throat> it has to do with Catholic slave ownership and moral law. You know, how could Catholics own slaves? And, and many did, especially in Kentucky. And there's been some historians that have done a lot of work on that. Uh, the, the grounding of this comes from a book written by Francis Patrick Kenrick. It's Peter Richard Kenrick's brother. He is the Bishop of, of Philadelphia and then the Archbishop of uh, Baltimore, he writes a book on moral theology, Theologica Moralis, and it's the standard textbook that's used prior to the Civil War in all seminaries here in the United States. It's uh, one chapter in particular is called De Servitute, and uh, it, it's in Latin, so the translation is a little rough, and I'll have to give you a better translation of the translation. But he basically has two paragraphs in which he says this. May Catholics own slaves? The answer seems to be in the affirmative, for the defect of the title must be considered as healed by the lapses of a long time, since the condition of society otherwise would always be uncertain. <laughs> okay, the second paragraph is a little bit better. Indeed, they sin who by force take unwilling men as slaves. But it does not seem unjust to hold the descendants of these slaves in slavery, namely a condition in which they were born and which they are not able to leave. So what he's saying is that the people who captured people in Africa or any place and they enslave them, that those people commit a mortal sin. But that the children of those people who have been enslaved, that's a natural state for them to be in. It's as if you're born with diabetes or if you're born blind, there's nothing you can do about it. And so his, his logic breaks down in the last part of the last sentence. It says, in which they were born and which they are not able to leave. The problem with that is they are able to leave. You know, sometimes it's through rebellion. Um, sometimes it's through manumission. You know, um, but that's not a natural state. And obviously, after the Emancipation Proclamation, that's very clear. Unfortunately, this was the moral theology that Catholics were learning in their seminaries and universities at the time. And that's why you have what you have. Archbishop uh, John Glennon has a very bad reputation concerning blacks. Uh, it's well earned. I'll show you that in a couple minutes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that he had about the same disdain for every ethnic group except for the Irish. Um, you know, he was not particularly good or nice to the Germans. Uh, certainly during the Second World War, uh, Germans had very little solace that came from the archdiocese. I'm sorry, the First World War. Very little solace. Um, he kind of enjoyed mocking the Italians. Um, he was hard on the Poles. Um, I'll tell you the, the Italian story. He, he was there at St. Ambrose during one of the processions uh, for the, uh, celebrating the Feast of St. Um, um, Sebastian. And as the he was standing at the entrance along with his uh, sec secretary, and as the procession came in, uh, there were a bunch of men carrying a big statue of, of St. Saint, uh, Saint, um, Saint Sebastian. And as they came in, it was too high, and St. Sebastian's head hit on the top of the, of the door, uh, lintel. And so they had to lower it and bring it in. And uh, the archbishop turns to his secretary and says, if it were St. Patrick, he would have ducked. 
Yet there are some things that he did. Uh, for one thing, he continued to support St. Elizabeth Parish. He also continued to support financially St. Francis Home for Negro Girls. Uh, by this time, it was in Normandy, and I, I've, I've read through the records of Catholic Charities and the archives of the Archdiocese, and money was allotted to that home along with all the other orphanages in St. Louis. They had received an equal portion from the Archdiocese. He also supported Father Dempsey when he set up a home for uh, uh, African American men. He had had one already for whites. Remember, this is an era of segregation, so they couldn't integrate, but he uh, had set up another home uh, for, uh, for whites, uh, for blacks, rather. He also allowed Father Malloy uh, to bamboozle the Missouri High School Athletic Association for St. Joseph's High School. This is a really interesting story. Uh, obviously, everything is segregated in, 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 in Missouri at the time, going into the early 1950s. There's one black high school in St. Louis, uh, Catholic high school, that's St. Joseph's High School. It's run by the Sisters of St. Joseph, and Father Malloy was uh, uh, volunteered there as a coach and also taught some courses. And um, at one point, he, he realized it's a very difficult thing because there were, there were only a few other high schools that he could have his basketball team play with. And so what he did was he went to the administration of McBride, CBC, and St. Louis U High and he asked them if they would farm together what he called the St. Louis Catholic League, and it would be, a, and, and, and then St. Joseph would be part of that league. And so they, they agreed to do that, and they submitted the paperwork to the Missouri uh, High School Athletic Association. And the Athletic Association knew McBride High School, they knew CBC High School, they knew uh, St. Louis U High, but they didn't know anything about St. Joseph's. And so they just assumed that it was white. And so they went ahead and they signed off. And with that, St. Joseph was now able to play in, um, uh, in, in, in state sports. Uh, he integrated uh, Missouri uh, high school sports. Where was St. Joseph um, I, I'm not really sure. I'd have to look that up. I'm not really sure. The early 50s is just when this happened? This would have been, uh, yeah, in the late 40s, early 50s. Yeah. Father? Yes. St. Joseph's still can be a powerhouse in the athletics, too, in the St. Louis area. St. Joseph's? St. Joseph's High School. The, the, the academy, the all girls school. I know. The what? No, the boys. Where is it? St. Joseph's? St. Joseph's? It's one of the basketball tournaments, the state tournament for the last couple of years. Where's it located? No, St. Joseph's High School before. No. Yeah. Okay, I'm confusing the place in the middle. St. Joe, I remember seeing it on TV during the Supreme Court. I just think it must be the girls' school out on Lindbergh. He also uh, allowed for, if not promoted, uh, outreach, uh, evangelical outreach to a black, the black apostolate. Uh, here you have uh, St. Martin de Porres' uh, mission. And standing in the middle of that, up at the top, is, is uh, Cardinal Glennon himself. Uh, this was a mission from St. Peter's Parish, and it was um, uh, at uh, Meacham Park, it was located at Meacham Park. But he also had a bad reputation, and it's well earned. And give you an example of this, for, for one thing, at the funeral of Thomas Franklin, who had been the butler of Archbishop uh, uh, Kenrick, stayed on with Archbishop Kane and then served as butler for uh, uh, Archbishop Glennon. At his funeral, um, the, the funeral was preached by uh, Archbishop Glennon. And at the time he assured in his homily, he assured the family that Franklin was in heaven. And that was a nice relief. But then he went on to say that he would be waiting in heaven for Glennon to die so that he could serve him again for all eternity. Pretty bad. It gets worse. <laughs> At one point, he has a meeting <clears throat> with um, Jane Adele Kaiser, and uh, she's there to talk to him about Catholic education. And uh, uh, Mrs. Kaiser is a very light-skinned, um, 
woman with um, uh, straight hair, her, her, uh, her straight hair. And so he assumed that she was white. And so they had a long conversation about Catholic education. And then she started mentioning about the fact that there were so few schools for black students to be able to attend. Basically, there were only two Catholic grade schools that black students could attend in St. Louis. There was uh, St. Joseph's High School, and then there was also another smaller uh, uh, girls' school in South St. Louis, but outside of that, nothing. And so she was really petitioning for the integration of all the Catholic schools. And at that point, uh, this is according to her, this comes from a deposition that she had sent to the papal nuncio. But she said, he said the following, he said, blacks, he charged, are violent, irresponsible, ungrateful, and undeserving of any greater generosity than they already received. Looming beneath Lenin's outrage was the fear that integration would lead to misogynation, which he was happily stated was forbidden by law. Uh, at that point, he escorts her out of the uh, chancery office, and, um, and, be and she walks out, and there's a car waiting for her, and it turns out that the pastor of St. Elizabeth's is there driving her. He had driven her too and, and brought her back. Um, but then she went ahead and sent this, uh, this letter to the papal nuncio, who then sent a letter to Glennon and basically had a copy of her letter and said, what the heck is going on in your diocese? Yeah. Uh, also, there's a conversation that he has with Father Malloy after he had uh, bamboozled the uh, Missouri Athletic Association, and they began talking about race relations. And again, Father Malloy is saying, we've got to move forward with this. We've got to integrate these schools. And with that, the priest was then transferred to a parish where we'd have no other interaction with African Americans. And that went on for a number of years. I'll see, show how that changed. So that's the Glennon legacy that we're, uh, we're dealing with. <clears throat> All this changed with the coming of Joseph Elmer Ritter. Um, Bishop, Archbishop Ritter, he was a bishop of Indianapolis. He did a number of things, made a number of changes, but one of the things he did was he uh, integrated the schools in Indianapolis and no problem with that. He arrives here in St. Louis and one of the first things he does is he finds Father Malloy and made him the pastor of Most Blessed Sacrament Parish. And Blessed Sacrament was a white parish that was rapidly becoming African American. And so uh, 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 Malloy did some wonderful work with that parish. I could talk about that later. He also closed St. Elizabeth Parish. And basically he said, you, the, those in St. Elizabeth, there are three parishes that are surrounding you. You go to those parishes. And he, and he brought about the integration of those other parishes. He also ordered the the integration of all Catholic schools in 1947. There was a committee that got together to oppose that. Uh, they uh, talked about actually um, uh, taking him to court. When he found out about it, he wrote a letter that was to be read at every mass throughout the archdiocese. And basically he said, if you oppose this and you oppose me by canon law, I will excommunicate you and the opposition fell apart immediately. He also assigned Father Shockley, John Shockley, to St. Bridget's and St. Leo parishes in pruitt Igo. sent a delegation in 1965 to Selma, Alabama, and then established the Human Rights Office. Uh, some of the sisters that were there in Selma, uh, up on the upper uh, uh, side there, uh, one of those, the uh, sister of St. Joseph on the far left, African American, I was really, really privileged to have lunch with her about three years ago. She's deceased now. And she told me about her trip to Selma and the experience that the sisters had. Remember that they're Catholic nuns, and she's an African-American, Catholic nuns going into the Deep South. And she said she, that the people there in the South were overawed at, at the very presence of these nuns. And th this is a, a, an area that is deeply anti-Catholic as well as uh, anti-black, uh, but they were just overawed by these women. 
She also said she'd seen uh, a copy of uh, volume three, and I have the lower picture in, in that copy. And she said to me, she said, uh, do you recognize the people there? And I said, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's Father Sullivan, and that's Bishop O'Donnell. And I didn't know who the guy was in the, in the background. And she goes, that's Mr. Vatterot. Oh. And then I didn't remember who the other priest was up front. But then she said, huh? So then she said, do uh, you see that satchel that, um, that uh, Bishop O'Donnell is carrying? And I said, yeah. She said, do you know what's in it? No. She said, $100,000 in bills. Whoa. I said, really? And she said, yeah. He was sent down with $100,000 so that if any St. Louisan got in trouble, that they, he would bail them out and get them back to St. Louis right away. What about Cardinal Carberry? Well, before he arrived in St. Louis, he was Bishop of Columbus, Ohio, and there he was a big supporter of open housing, in other words, integration. <clears throat> he was interviewed, before he arrived here in St. Louis, he was interviewed by Martin Dugan, uh, who was editor of the St. Louis um, uh, Globe Democrat, and he said the following, that open housing is a logical consequence of our stand on civil rights. You don't take half, half a stand. Later on, he also uh, supported the Project Equality, which called for open employment in church institutions, and then came here to St. Louis, continued the same um, work, and uh, immediately upon hearing of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, he went to the cathedral and offered a mass. It was unannounced, as best I could tell, but the entire cathedral was filled. He was also a big supporter of the Human Rights Office. Uh, there he is um, receiving a portrait of Pope um, uh, Paul VI. Do you uh, recognize the artist? Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood did that. Kurt Flood. Yeah, he did that. Yeah, he was an artist as well as a great baseball player. Monsignor Shockley at, um, at uh, Prude Igo, at, at uh, St. Bridget's and St. Leo's. One of the first things he did was he went into Pruitt Igo and began asking, just walking around and asking people, what do you need? And they all said the same thing, jobs, housing, education. And so what he did was he began having community meetings in the church basements at St. Leo and at St. Bridget's. And with that, he set up, uh, first of all, uh, volunteers in order to go and to visit uh, Pruitt Igo families. And I think we've got one of the volunteers in our midst. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they went and they surveyed the, the needs for the residents. They passed these on to the priests, who then would do uh, visitations. And some of the projects that he got started included, in 1964, what he referred to as the VIP program, or the Voluntary Improvement Program. And this is where uh, people would come, Prude Igo residents would come, and they would study for their GEDs, and within two years, he had 460 students. And eventually, they're going to be able to graduate from high school with those degree, those those diplomas, and then that's the education part. And then after that, begin to seek jobs. He um, also set up through a grant the equal of um, the Office of Equal Opportunity. And unfortunately, and that's some $230,000 a year he got from the federal government. Unfortunately, there was a rift uh, that, caused, that was caused by the, uh, the OEO coming in and doing surveys of people and asking very invasive questions. Uh, how many children do you have? Uh, does your husband live at home? Do you have a husband? Uh, how many fathers are uh, father these children? Th things like that. And the director of the program, by the name of Hickenlooper, just uh, refused to do it. And ultimately, uh, Hickenlooper had to leave, and they had to fill out those farms. Otherwise, they wouldn't get the money. Uh, he also set up the St. Bridget Housing Fund uh, through the Bicentennial Civic Improvement Corporation. And what they did here was, so you got education, you're getting jobs, now housing. 
And what they did was St. Bridges went out <clears throat> and they purchased houses in the neighborhood that were absolutely dilapidated and they were un uninhabitable. And they would buy up these houses real cheap, then they would fix them up. And what they did was um, Monsignor Shockley would not bring in contractors from the outside, but rather what he did was he took men in Pruitt Igo and he had them trained, apprenticed, in order to act as masons and carpenters, electricians, plumbers, and they built the houses themselves and got a skill as a result of that. And then he secured a loan from uh, Palazzi Bank. Um, it was, uh, you put 20% down, it, the, the loan was 80%. And then the payments on that loan was $55 a month. That's the exact amount that they had to pay for rent at Pruitt Igo. And so rather than live in Pruitt Igo, they were actually able to add equity to their own home, home, home ownership. Um, <clears throat> he made life livable at Pruitt Igo. Uh, for one thing, year after year, he rented a, a, a really big um, uh, trough from the city of St. Louis. And they bring it up to St. Bridget's and they put it in a schoolyard and, um, and they filled it up with water. And all summer long, the kids from Pruitt Igo could go over and, and swim around in there. It, what he also did then was he also hired uh, teenagers from Pruitt Igo to go and uh, act as, as lifeguards and it gave a little money as a result. He also sent out word that he needed bicycles. And he ended up with about 40 or 50 bicycles that people donated. And so he brought the kids from Pruitt Igo in and he taught them how to repair bicycles. And they got their bicycles all repaired. They stored them at St. Louis U High until St. Louis U High needed the room. And so then they, they shifted over to the boathouse in Forest Park and they stored them there. And every Saturday or Sunday, they would come down and, and go to the boathouse. They would get the bikes and they would ride all over Forest Park. And they did this week after week until one day when they got down, they opened the door and they found that someone had come in and stole all the bicycles. You know, yeah, you win some, lose some. Education. 1969, the Catholic teachers meeting that took place, uh, Cardinal Carberry expressed among three of his goals. One of his goals was to make sure that Catholic education would be available for uh, uh, children in the, in the North St. Louis area. Um, at that time, there were 21 parishes that had schools. There were two high schools also, uh, St. Mark's and St. Alphonsus, as well as a junior high school, which was Providence. And it was staffed by 133 religious sisters, quite a commitment. But these were times that were changing. And by 1974, only 15 parishes had schools. And St. Alphonsus and Providence had been closed. Now, there was a new experiment that was introduced at this time, and that was Bishop Healy School. It's named, named after the first African-American Catholic bishop in the United States. Um, and this is uh, Bishop um, James Healy over on the right. He was the bishop of uh, Portland, Maine. And uh, <clears throat> what they did was they combined together the, the uh, Most Blessed Sacrament, Visitation Holy Ghost, and then another parish, which was back then simply called Brem. Today it's St. Augustine's Parish. But it was called Brem back then because it was a combination of, of Barbara, Rose, Edwards, and Mark. So the enrollment was 311, although in that entire enrollment only 30 children were actually Catholic, and most of the faculty was black as well as the principal. That began a whole movement towards setting up the Federation of Catholic Urban Schools, our focus. And those are made up of Bishop Healy School, Cathedral School, Central Catholic, St. Nicholas, Holy Cross, Holy uh, Guardian Angels, Most Holy Trinity, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and St. Engelbert School. So those schools made up focus. And what they did was they shared um, resources with each other. Uh, so a uh, music teacher, they'd have one music teacher for those eight schools, and they would go around. The Sisters of St. Joseph brought in uh, speech specialists, and they would share um, in, among those schools. 
Unfortunately, over time, each of those schools has closed down with the exception of St. Engelbert's, which is now called St. Louis Catholic Academy. It's located at, at the old St. Engelbert School. There are about 100 students there now. What about the possibility of white families fleeing from integrating public schools? That became an impossibility because Archbishop May, who had actually started under Archbishop uh, Cardinal Carberry, had what he called the no transfer policy. And what that basically meant was that if you had a child in a, in a public school and that public school integrated and you wanted to get your child out into an all white Catholic school, you could not do it. They would not accept that uh, transfer. The only way a, a white child could enroll in a Catholic school, if they had been enrolled in a public school the year before, was if they were coming in from out of town and they were moving to St. Louis. And he, he said this himself, he said, we're not going to allow our schools to be used to undercut the law. And at the time, uh, Catholic schools were pretty on, uh, on their way to integration. Of the 40 city Catholic schools, uh, 22 of them had a minority enrollment between 9% and 90%. Then the other aspect of this is aid to Catholic schools. Um, <clears throat> Archbishop May and Sister Marianne Eckhoff in 1991 set up the Today and Tomorrow Educational Fund. And as of 2017, the last uh, uh, time I had statistics on this, the Today and Tomorrow Educational Fund has provided scholarships for 4,300 children. It is the fourth largest elementary school scholarship program in the United States and has granted more than $90 million. 98% of the uh, TTEF scholars graduate from high school. And of those 98%, 99 go on to post-secondary education. And many times they're the first in their family uh, to, to go to college. So the, uh, the um, Today and Tomorrow Foundation has been very, very successful in, in doing great things. And now with this latest ruling from the Supreme Court this past week, the possibility of getting even more funding is, uh, is for, up until this time, this is all philanthropic money. And no state money at all, but now with the Supreme Court ruling, it, it might be possible to get more money uh, to programs like this. You also have in 1971, uh, May 18th, Cardinal Carberry invited Father Placid Gust's uh, order to evangelize in St. Louis. This is the Society of Our Mother of Peace. Uh, I understand that they were here in this parish a number of years back. They did door-to-door -door census uh, evangelization <clears throat> and one of the things they did was a survey, which was very interesting, and they found that of the people surveyed, 82% said that the Catholic Church was a white-only church, 82%. And yet, the 27 parishes that were served by the order were either totally or predominantly African-American. All the pastors were white, with the exception of the pastor visitation Holy Ghost, but most of the permanent deacons in North City Deanery or North County Deanery are African American. The greatest success is uh, St. Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. They counted 497 converts to that parish, which is a very strong parish today. You also have groups, on, I'll, I'll end this up pretty quickly, groups like the um, St. Louis Association of Community Organizations, SLACO, was founded in 1980 led by Sister Mary Dolan. <clears throat> they uh, um, boarded up abandoned houses. They had cleanup uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, they provided low and moderate housing with the assistance of Charles Vanderrug, uh, mustard seed, revolving loan funds, uh, watchdog for um, neighborhoods, uh, Operation Food Search, again, uh, very important. They partnered with uh, Catholic Charities, Food Crisis, in 1983, when they got started that first year, they had $5 million in food donated to 200 pantries, 20 uh, soup kitchens, and 100 centers preparing meals for the hungry and the homeless. And they continue doing that wonderful work today. A survey found that 41% of the recipients were white, 43% black, 
Uh, 86% of the households had at least one child, 20% had uh, adults over the age of 60, and the survey found that the least served, the most underserved people in St. Louis were elderly white women in South St. Louis. Two African American bishops, uh, Bishop Stey, Bishop Braxton, <coughs> And I'll just go through rather quickly. These are things that are being done right now, uh, not just for blacks, but for anybody in need. And uh, so you have St. Vincent of Paul conferences in every parish. There's 143 conferences in, in this uh, archdiocese. And right behind you, you can see all the goods that are being made available for our people in our own neighborhood. We're in this just one conference. The Sisters of the Good Shepherd, uh, Home for Vulnerable Women, St. Uh, Franciscan Sisters of Mary have a program called Almost Home for homeless teen mothers, Dismas House for former offenders, uh, Mother of the Council Nursing Home, Our Ladies Inn, uh, supporting pregnant women and their children dealing with homelessness, uh, Cardinal Ritter, Senior Services, Catholic Charities um, here in St. Louis, assisting 156 people last year alone, uh, Catholic Family Services, Good Shepherd Children and Family Services for Foster Care Adoptions, Expected Mother Counseling, Mary Grove Day and Residential Treatment for Children, uh, including um, diagnosis and, and therapy and education and health care. Uh, Mary Queen of Peace Center, a family centered uh, behavioral health care for women with addictions, St. Patrick's Center, Father Dempsey's Charity. I was very privileged to be chaplain there for one year. Uh, Guardian Angel Settlement Association, um, tuition assistance to the poor, Malor Middle Class, Today and Tomorrow Foundation, Tuition Family Plan, uh, Catholic Family Tuition Assistance Endowment Fund, Parish Employee Endowment Fund, and now, most recently, we all participated in this, the uh, Beyond Sunday. In 19, or 2015, Archbishop Carlson reestablished the Archdiocese and Peace and Justice Commission. This was um, in response to Ferguson, and the object behind it was to dismantle systemic racism. The director of that program is uh, Marie Canyon, and she said the following when she was uh, appointed, I, what I bring to the commission is having worked with issues of poverty, race, and lack of education, lack of adequate health care, lack of employment every day, day in, day out, for almost 30 years. So when the Archbishop asked me to take this position, I was excited because I think it's a chance for me to take what I've been doing on a day-to-day, -day, case by case basis, and really look at the same issues, but from a systemic viewpoint. And so that's ongoing, taking place. So we've only got a couple minutes left. <clears throat> um, if you have any questions or observations that you'd like to make, and um, 